Hi, I did a review of this O1 HDS 272S 3-in-1 oscilloscope, multimeter, and arbitrary waveform generator combo handheld unit last time, and I was extremely impressed by the features and performance, despite some shortcomings. Specifically, the oscilloscope implementation deserves a lot of praise, as in some ways, the performance is even better than many standalone digital oscilloscopes. For instance, the update rate is very fast on this oscilloscope, and the XY mode also performs surprisingly well. So if you haven't watched that review, I would highly recommend you to check it out follow the link in the video description below. And as I mentioned in my previous video, the O1 HDS 272S competes directly with the Hentac 2D72 I reviewed a while ago. So I will do a side-by-side -side comparison in the upcoming video, so you can clearly see the pros and cons of each of these meters and decide for yourself which one better fits your needs. In this video though, we are going to concentrate on the teardown. But before doing that, let's check out the battery consumption first. As I mentioned in the review video, the battery consumption seems to be quite high on this device. So let's do some quantitative measurement to get an idea of roughly what you can expect of the runtime to be with the batteries fully charged. Here I have already taken the back cover off and you can see we have two batteries similar to what we had in HDS272 that we reviewed with the Hentech unit. And these batteries are in parallel as well, so we can just measure using one battery. Now, according to the spec sheet, the batteries are supposed to be 2200 milliamp hours each, and there are two batteries. So the total capacity would be 4400 milliamp hours. Let's first take a look at the standby current. For that, I'm removing one of the batteries so I can measure the current more accurately. And for that, I'm going to change the meter to milliamp so that I can take a look at the standby current. And you can see we are only enjoying about uh, 17, 18 milliamps. That is actually very, very good. So now let me try to power it on. And for that, I need to change it to the amp mode because I think the current draw is significantly higher. And I'm going to try to uh, press that button while we're doing our measurement here. So just bear with me here. Okay. Let's see if I can. Yep, I found the button. Now you can see when the oscilloscope turned on, we're drawing about 630 milliamps. So the the oscilloscope is on right now, as you can see. Hopefully you can see from this angle. And that is actually quite a lot. So just some back of the envelope calculation. I think that is about the three and a half hours runtime for a single battery. And for two batteries, that's roughly seven hours. Now it's actually still pretty good, but not as good compared to the Hentac 2D72 last time we reviewed. And with the current consumption measurement out of the way, let's uh, open it up and see what is inside. And now you're looking at the inside of this Handtech HDS 272S. From a casual glance, the layout looks quite similar to what's inside the Handtech 2D72 we did a teardown a while ago. I will take this board out very shortly, but uh, from this side, you can actually see a couple of components here. And these two are obviously the input BNC jacks for channel one and channel two. And the input section is actually shielded by this shielding can with some copper tape on top. I probably will not be able to pry open this uh, can just by the look of it because I see that this can is actually soldered on on multiple points instead of being screwed on like what we saw in that 2D72. But given what we have seen in these uh, low-end oscilloscopes, the front end probably there's uh, not too much to see anyway. And here, this BNC jack, that's obviously our arbitrary waveform generator output. 
Right next to the input section shielding can, we have a section that contains some power supply circuitry on this side of the board. This uh, tiny QFN chip, which I took a quick look earlier, that has a marking of VUCI, which is a Texas Instruments step-down converter chip. Towards the bottom of the section, you can see we have a botched down capacitor, and uh, if you look carefully, there were already two SMD capacitors on this board, so clearly, during design time, something was not totally taken into consideration. So during testing, they must have found that they actually needed this extra capacitance, and therefore they had to botch on this uh, capacitor. But the good news is it's actually glued down, so it will not vibrate during transportation, so that is quite secure. And here we have another electrolytic capacitor that is a through-hole component, and we do have the proper footprint here, so that's actually by design. Again, this capacitor is also glued down properly, so it will not vibrate and uh, somehow come out during transportation or usage. Here we have another QFN chip. This one is a BQ25616J, which is another chip from Texas Instrument. It is a single-cell battery charger chip. This chip is obviously responsible for charging these two lithium cells. Similarly, in what we have seen in the 2D72 teardown that we did with a hand-tag scope, that uh, the cell arrangements are very similar. In fact, the charging circuitry, despite using different charging chip, the topology is actually almost identical. As you can see, we have these two 5-pin chips here, and those are probably used for balancing these two batteries, as we can confirm that uh, the battery negative terminals are not connected together but uh, the positive terminals are actually connected together. So if you see here, these are connected, but uh, the negative, they are not connected. So my assumption is that these batteries are charged independently via these two current paths here. And the, in the upper section here, we don't have a lot of components. This little chip here is a RS8412, which is a rail-to-rail -rail output op amp. And this is obviously our buzzer circuitry. And here we have a pulse transformer, similar to what we have seen in that uh, hand tech device as well. And on this side of the battery, we have this section of circuitry. By the look of it, we have this uh, JTAG header. So that is probably used to initially program the unit and also to debug the unit as well. And here, by the look of it, we have a flat pack board to board connector. So presumably there's another board underneath this one. These four devices here are UWM1018 long creepage phototransistor photocoppers. They are used to fully isolate the digital multimeter section from the rest of the circuitry. Now if we move to the right a little bit more, we can see this is the multimeter input section. And it's just by the look of it, this section is actually noticeably different than what we found in the Hantac 2D72, which I will pull up a picture and put it here for you to see the difference here. And uh, noticeably, these uh, binding posts are actually soldered on the side. There are a couple of advantages of this design compared to that a tube soldered directly onto the board. One is that these extra sections serve as a strain relief that prevents the solder joint from cracking during repeated use. Another advantage is that the inside of these uh, plugs are hollow, so they can actually accommodate plugs of a different uh, length instead of uh, blocking them from the bottom. One welcome design in this uh, HDS200 series is that uh, we have a proper fuse for the high current, the 10 amp range. And if you recall from our teardown of the Hentec 2D72, that meter does not have a fuse in its 10 amps current measurement path due to layout constraints. By the look of it, here we have two footprints for the same fuse here, so presumably they have a different sizes of fuses to choose from. For the low current range, looks like we have a poly fuse installed here. And by the look of it, we have a proper current jump for the high current measurement range, and we also have a surface mount resistor serves as our low current uh, range current shunt. If you look closely at this section, you will see quite a few of these high voltage isolation slots, cutouts, and there are a few here as well. So these are around the input jack. This is important as this meter claims to be a CAT3 rated meter, 
although there doesn't seem to be any protection devices on this side of the board, except perhaps we have a PTC here, but I don't see any MOVs on the input section, at least not on this side of the board. And very similar to the Hentec 2D72 design that we saw, we also have two of these relays for handling input range switching. Okay, so now let's uh, remove the remaining screws and uh, take this board out. Okay, with those uh, screws removed, I'm able to flip this board over and let's take a look at this side. Now, unfortunately, there's a pretty bad glare as you can see it on the reflection here. So I think I'm going to zoom it in so that we can get rid of some of the glare. And up here, obviously, this is our keypad section. There's not a whole lot of interesting thing going on here. So we're just going to go through very briefly. But uh, one thing you can see is the silk screen here. It says 2020, September 27th. So clearly, this board design has been going around for a while. So now let me shift this uh, section up so we can see the bottom a little bit more clearly. Now with the shrouding removed, you can see these input jacks a little bit better here. And as I mentioned earlier, I do prefer this kind of mount than what's in the Hentec 2D72, in which these input jacks are mounted directly onto the PCB itself. As the stress on the PCB is actually reduced via these uh, springy extensions here. Towards the top here, you can see we have this uh, digital multimeter chip. Unfortunately, I can't see any marking on this chip, but it's safe to say that this is a 20,000 count digital multimeter chip. And next to this uh, DMM chip, we have a couple of these uh, 8-pin chips. These are memory chips that presumably are used to store calibration constants and some other stuff. Not entirely sure what they're too used. And moving further left, we have five of these additional photocoplers that isolate the DMM section from the rest of the circuitry here. The main microcontroller used on this board is a GD32F303, which is a ARM Cortex M4 microcontroller. And of course, next to the microcontroller, we have another memory chip here. And now let me flip over the LCD so we can see what is going on on the other side. So let me move the board just a little bit so we can see it more clearly here. The main FPGA used on this board is an Unlogic EG4X20BG. This chip right here is a Texas Instruments DEC 904E, which is a 14-bit 165 mega samples per second digital to analog converter. And if you look at the connection here, that is actually driven directly by this FPGA. So this DAC actually drives our output of the arbitrary waveform generator. Now the DAC obviously is used for the arbitrary waveform generation, but interestingly, I do not see an output current feedback op amp that is used to drive the output, at least not on this side. We also have two of these general purpose op amps on board, these are TP2274s. Obviously, the input signal from the BNC input from channel 1 and channel 2 needs to be digitized before they can be processed by the FPGA. Now, if you take a look here, we have this MXT2088, which is a dual 100 mega samples per second ADC. So clearly, this ADC is used to digitize the input channel. But the question is, this is a dual 100 mega samples per second ADC, whereas the input channel per channel is a 125 mega samples per second. So I'm thinking that they must have overclocked this ADC by at least 25% to achieve that 125 mega samples per second per channel input. And if you follow the traces, you will see that the output from the MXT2088 ADC also goes into this OnLogic FPGA. So the output from the ADC is also processed by this chip here. One thing I forgot to mention earlier, if you take a look at the silk screen, you will see that the version of the board is at 2.1. So there has been many revisions before we get to this version of the board. 
And I would be curious to see what had changed in terms of layout of the different components on each of the revisions. And uh, by the way, the LCD used in this unit is a 3.5 inch LCD, which is quite gorgeous. Okay, now it's time to put everything back together. And that pretty much concluded this teardown. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe and share. I will catch up with you next time.